on this episode of the Oakland Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We continue to break down OU's spring roster by looking at the defensive backs. Then in the National College Football Roundup, we give you some of the things we're looking for in spring games that are happening this weekend, and we finish up with our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, April 12th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades, and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of april all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now recording this on wednesday morning please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment ted i'm nervous about the thunder playing game tonight i'm real nervous <laughs> That's good. That's that's healthy it's good to be nervous it's, it's good to have this this is what it feels like to be in the postseason this is a good it's, thing I'm I'm very excited for the entire build up today. Now, before before we jump into talking some OU defensive backs, there was a development last year on the podcast that caught quite a bit of traction. And that was bearded Ted. <laughs> Are, is is bearded Ted making a comeback here? I'm I'm starting to see a little uh, little facial hair growth there, bud. Well, here's the thing. It started off as laziness and a time issue um and then it's it's devolved since then this will not last long matter of fact this is probably the last day <laughs> well the, if you are one of the youtube viewers which by the way if you don't subscribe to our youtube channel please do let us let us know what you think about bearded ted maybe talk him out of <laughs> shaving the facial hair I uh, I remember there were quite a few fans last year. I know, I know it. Dang it! Uh, well, if the comments say let it roll, then I may have to let it roll. Okay. So hey, if you want if you want to see some facial hair on our man Ted Layman, you got to let us know. All right, let's let's jump into we're go, we're going to continue our breakdown of OU spring roster, and, and these are my favorite days because. I really don't have to do much. I just, I just kind of sit back and let you cook. <laughs> I don't know a ton about defensive back play. Now I know more than most, I would say, but there are a lot of guys that are jockeying to try to get snaps on the field at corner and safety. We're not going to talk about cheetah. Remember we broke down cheetah in our, in our episode where we did linebackers and cheetahs. If you missed that one, you can, you can go find it, but Let's start, let's start with corners. And this is probably the easiest way to get this conversation going. You've been out to multiple spring practices. You pay way more attention to corners than I do. Who has stood out to you? Um, I, you know, I, I think corner, I guess I should say this just in general. I think our secondary is probably the deepest um couple of positions on the entire team corner and safety i agree um, with that i think we've got really good healthy competition i think we've got a good mix of veteran players and young highly recruited players that are coming in and pushing for some of those spots i think it's really really healthy what's going on um you know woody washington who's just been stellar for oklahoma uh he's back it's hard to find him out there because he's changed numbers. Everyone has changed numbers and every number is duplicated. So it could be difficult. Um, but Woody Washington looks good. Um, just like you would expect. He's, he's turned in, he's gone from being the young, explosive, athletic 
kid to really the veteran of the group. And you can tell that his, his experience is there. He's just way more comfortable. And it's funny. And it's, it's not just corner. It's really all positions. The better you get, the slower you play, which you end up playing way faster, if that makes sense. You're just more calm. You're patient. You're under control. Smooth is fast. And that's what Woody Washington looks like right now. Yeah, so don't be confused, ladies and gentlemen, when you when you go to the spring game. Woody Washington now wearing number five. Mm-hmm. So he was zero the last couple of years. Now he is five. Billy Bowman, who was five last year, is now number two. And right. those are two guys you're going to want to know because I think they're the most consistent guys in the secondary. Yeah. So don't. They're, they're both going to play at a high level, but don't get them mixed up. I know it can be a little confusing. There's a good, really good chance that a bunch of people come out of the spring game saying, hey, Bowman looked good at corner. You <laughs> know, I didn't know they were going to move him, but he looked good over there at corner. Yeah, uh, I think Woody Washington's looked good. You know, and, and we know what we're going to get from him in in the run game. The he, He's a physical player. He'll come up and pop you. He'll, he'll tackle well. So um, I, I think Woody Washington's – He's 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 grown into the player that we hoped he would, I think, at this point. Yeah, I think the thing that stood out to me about Woody going out to spring practice, and I want to give Jay Belay some credit. He really challenged him last season about, you know, with just with the physicality of playing the position. And you think about the physicality of playing corner, you're like, okay, you're physical in coverage, right? But Valai was on him about getting off blocks and, and not just not just getting guys to the ground as a tackler but really really physically imposing yourself when you are in those situations as a tackler and i think woody washington has taken that to heart and he is he's undoubtedly like you watch him engage with wide receivers like he's come a long way at with using his hands getting off blocks and then making plays as a tackler yeah, no, I totally agree. And, you know, look for them to use him uh, in some different areas as a weapon. Um, cat blitzes on the short side of the field off of, off the corner position or, you know, getting a, a corner and safety involved maybe in, in a run play. So, yeah, I, I think Woody is – he's primed to have the best season of his career, which is what we need. Completely agree. I, I feel like Woody's got – one of the corner spots locked down and then the other corner spot is a bit up in the air, man. Who who do you think the major candidates are for that other corner spot? Well, you've got, you've got Jaden Davis who played quite a bit last year. You got Kendall Dolby, who is the junior college transfer who's played really well. Um, You've got, Kenai Walker, who's, you know, maybe the biggest and most physical guy out there, but um, I think he's a little bit behind in in some of the experience maybe or, um, you know, just understand he's the had, defense. He's had some trouble staying healthy. Yeah. Um, the, the guy that I'm really excited about, and I don't know, maybe the coaches saw this coming, but – the early arrival, Josiah Wagner, out of Washington State, is a baller. Every time he's out there, like, I don't know like what he looks like in just pure one-on-ones and what his like his bust ratio is or how many mental mistakes he's having out there. It's hard to keep up with all that stuff when you're just out for a practice here and there. But the dude makes plays. He makes plays. He's batting balls he's intercepting passes he's making physical tackles out on the perimeter he's just he's a guy that finds the action and you know as as a early arrival corners one of the positions uh we always talk about that if you got it you got it you know there's not a whole lot of of mental stuff there you can go out and play uh he's got it so i think he's clearly in the dogfight i would say um Probably Jane Davis, Kendall Dolby, and Josiah Wagner would probably be my one, two, three. But there's, there's still other guys in there uh, getting in on the mix. Yeah, 
uh, Gentry Williams, that situation, right, yeah, with the scary yeah. situation to that happened at the end of winter workouts. They're, they've just really eased him back into things. So I, I think Gentry is is more than capable of challenging for a lot of snaps on the field at one of the corner spots. It's just it, it seems like that's going to be a bit of a process, right? They're just being extra cautious with that entire situation, but. The, the thing about Josiah Wagner is it's not just you, man. Like everybody that has been out there, that's been able to see, you know, some of these scrimmage snaps or see them do team stuff towards the end of practice. Everybody brings him up. He is one of the talks of spring practice. And I, I, I get that he's new. So it's kind of at the top of mind for coaches, for, you know, for different people, but. If you make plays, I don't care how old you are, man. Yeah. I, I do not, not care. They're not just like routine plays. It's they're wild plays. The first practice I went out to in in a team move the ball period in three consecutive plays, he chased a receiver all the way across the field uh, on a scramble drill and like made a diving pass breakup. The very next play, they ran like a swing to a running back who tried to run over him on the perimeter, and he decleated the running back. And then I think the next, like the the next play in the series, he made an interception, like one, two, three. And that was after everyone I had, you know, been there, and everyone was talking about him before that practice. So he's he's making all kinds of plays out there, and wow, plays. He's a yeah. hitter. He's aggressive. That's what you want. I, I think that the word that keeps coming up in conversations about Josiah Wagner is instincts. Mm -hmm. Like he just has, he's got a great feel for what's going That's on. That's a great place to start. It, it's hard to be, you know, there's guys that are good athletes that become technically proficient and then try to get the instinct part. It's better to have the instincts right away and then become technically proficient. And it it's a it's a really good way to be ahead of the curve and, and he clearly is. Yeah. And it, looking at Jaden Davis, it's just the guy's gotta stay healthy, right? Now he's not gonna get any taller. You know, he's he's not he he's not the longest corner, but it, it's almost it's all about confidence for him. Like when the confidence is there, I feel like he plays at a decently high level, but Kendall Dolby's a guy I've been impressed with when I've been out there. I, yep. I mean, he is, he's certainly played himself into the mix of being a starter. And, you know, one of the scrimmage I was out there for, he was rolling with the ones. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that I expect Dolby and, and Davis to be, to, to, to be the main guys at that other corner position, but, you have to assume with what Wagner has shown throughout spring ball that they're going to want to throw him out there for snaps yeah. just because he, he's just showed so much already that I can't imagine he's one of those guys that they're only playing four games. Now, hey, you never know with how the, the red shirt rules work. But, yeah, that other corner spot, man, that's going to be extremely competitive. And if Kenai Walker can ever play <laughs> play as good as he looks – then things get even more interesting. So I he's big dude. Yeah, he's a big dude. But you, you got anything else on the corners? No, I would I would just say like right now, I would expect Woody Washington to be our lockdown guy. And I would expect at the other spot that we see multiple players throughout the season. I, I yeah. think that I think we're gonna we're gonna have multiple corners play a lot of meaningful snaps. Like, a, I think there's going to be a good, healthy rotation at corner. Yeah, I'm with you. It, it seems like that's how it's going to play out. All right, let's move to the safeties, which I don't know if there is a there's a position with better competition on this entire football team. I'm excited about the talent level. I'm excited about the depth. Uh, I'm excited about how much – these guys seem to care, like the leadership roles that they are embracing on the team. But where, where's the conversation start with at safety for you, Ted? Billy Bowman. Billy Bowman. He's 
you know, safety. I think Billy Bowman is one of the best, maybe the best safety in the Big 12. But sometimes at safety, it won't appear that way if you're not getting solid play in front of you. Like safety, you, you generally play in alleys, right? You, if, you're, if you're run support, you know where your fit is. Like the ball's supposed to come here. Uh, and then, yeah, you're going to break off and go make a play wherever uh, it, it ends up being. Uh, same thing in the passing game. Uh, you're going to run the, the middle of the field. You're going to run a half field. Um, you're going to come down and replace and play a flat. Like You have to have good solid play around you to really be able to stick out as a safety. If you don't get good solid play, then you're the one that looks like an ass all the time because you're trying to make a tackle on a wide open running back that is out of the gate. He's bearing down on you. He outweighs you by 20 pounds. And you've got all this space and you either get run over or, you know, you try and go up and make a physical play, and get shook. And that's because all of the players around you have not played as well. My hope is that we get a lot better play by the other 10. And if that's the case, Billy Bowman has uh, at least an all conference type of season. He's explosive. He's violent. He is quick. He's got good top-end speed. He's got great instincts. He's just an all-around really good football player. Um, he's an experienced guy coming in now. He's still technically, I, I guess you could say he's still young, but he's got a lot of football that he's played at several different positions, and I think he's not, not just one of the most um, athletically gifted guys out there. He's also one of the smartest. Yeah, and he looks fantastic. He does. Right, what up to about one ninety five? Yeah, he and it's looks. A, it's a lean one ninety five. Yeah, he he is looking the part now, and not only do uh, I I feel like he's the best player in the secondary, and if everyone else does their job like you're saying, he's got a chance to be the best player on the team. Yeah, uh, I and it, yep. maybe just maybe I just keep that conversation to the defense. Like he's got that type of athleticism, explosiveness, instincts, like all of that stuff, football intelligence. I I am my, my expectations for him after what I've seen in spring ball, like they are sky high yeah. for what he's going to do during the season. I agree. I totally agree. I, I, I don't see any limit to what he's he's going to be capable other than, you know, can we get a good pass rush? Can we fit the runs like we're supposed to? Can we get lined up in underneath coverage to where we're not trying – play after play exposing our guys on the back end? That's that's the only thing that I see that would uh, keep him from having a, just a huge season. I feel like it, it's very similar – to the conversation we had about Woody Washington having one of the corner spots locked down. It feels like Bart, you just, unless he gets injured, right? Billy Bowman's going to be out there as one of the safety, as one of the safeties. What do you think about the other spot? The other spot is, is interesting. I key Lawrence, I think is, is got to be the leader in the clubhouse right now. Um, RSJ, Robert Spears Jennings, was playing a lot, um, has had the shoulder issues, I guess, missed the rest of uh, spring, but he's going to be back in the competition in the fall. Uh, big, physical, good-looking safety back there. Um, Key Lawrence is, he's grown a lot. He's grown a lot. He's, he's a, a little bit different player than he was a year or two years ago. Uh, he feels he, he's another guy that feels all of a sudden like he's he's the old vet out there. He's talking, he's chirping at the backers on on where to adjust and and where to get lined up. Um, you know, you, you don't have to ask him to communicate. He's constantly talking out there, which is good. Um, we know he's got good size and athleticism for the position. Um, and this this is not directed at him. It's really just a, a general basic rule of thumb at safety you got to continue to become better tacklers um better tacklers know when to make the physical play know when to 
uh, you know, get run over, but make the drag down tackle, the safe tackle. Uh, you know, I think that if he cleans up tackling, I think, I think mentally he's going to be, he's way ahead of where he was uh, for last season. So like the floor with key Lawrence has come way up with the, the type of play you're going to get from him. And I think he's, he's got enough uh, athleticism, good physical traits that he can continue to take the ceiling higher. I, that's who the leader in the clubhouse is right now. Uh, Reggie Pearson, transfer from Tech, I think is probably going to be the utility type of guy at the safety position. I think he'll be able, just because his experience as he is, be able to play both safety spots. Um, also play Cheetah if you need him to. And, you know, he gives you some good depth there. Um, like the, the, to me, the, the wild card is what are you going to get out of Peyton Bowen? You know, he's, he's the five-star early arrival and, you know, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of him personally, but you know, it, it's one of those things where I, if, if there's not much difference between he and maybe key Lawrence or, you know, whoever's starting to gain those snaps in front of him. Do you just roll with the the youngster now that you've got an experienced guy like Billy Bowman out there at the other safety spot because those two work in tandem on everything that they do? It makes it a little easier to to play a guy as young as Peyton Bowen. Yeah, and when I saw him out there, he looks like a five star safety. Yeah, uh, the suddenness, the explosiveness. Now, of course, missed missed quite a bit a spring ball with that tragic situation with his sister, but he, he looks like he's going to be a special player but now. And you know, this very well safety in that defense is that is a challenging position mentally, but it seems like his football IQ is really, really good. So I, I, I could see him, being one of those guys where you're, you know, week four, week five, and all of a sudden you start seeing him playing some more snaps out there, it, them working him in, like as he gets more comfortable and more comfortable. He's just, he's so talented. It's hard to think that he's not going to be out there in some capacity at some point in the season. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's also, they've given him some time at, at Cheetah as well. Um, and that's another guy that I didn't mention is Justin Harrington. Justin Harrington is, um, he's looking like he's going to be the starting cheetah, but he put, he plays safety as well in some of their other packages. So, um, you know, whenever you start to get in some of your bigger things, like, um, like your three man, your true three man stuff, where you could be dropping eight, uh, they could be moving, uh, Justin Harrington around a little bit out there as well. And he's a he's an option for you should injury become a problem or something and and you lose a couple of guys back there. So yeah, I mean I when Robert Spears Jennings gets back, hopefully everything goes good with his his shoulder surgery. You got a deep group, man. You got a deep group, competitive. Um we've we've we're slowly getting bigger and more athletic back there, which is good. Now I know Bowman is what's he listed at five ten, five eleven. It does that size. You don't even notice it at all as, as good as he looks in, in pads. So yeah, I think we're in a good spot. Yeah. And I mean, we haven't mentioned Damon Harmon, Jaden Rowe, uh, Macari Vickers the early and Rowley. He looks the part yep. like they got, they got all kinds of guys that you walk out there and you go, Oh, he looks good. Mm -hmm. Who's that? He looks good. And it, it's all about those guys developing into football players right there there's more to this thing than looking the part yep. so i i do think the secondary as a whole and, and i know that everything you do as a secondary is dependent on what's going on in front of you in that front seven but it really does feel like with the talent level uh with the depth with you know the consistency you're going to get from guys like Woody Washington and Billy Bowman, it, it feels like this could be the strength of the defense. But the other the other guys have to play at a high level or else 
just like any other secondary, doesn't really matter how talented you are. If you got to cover for four or five seconds, bad things are going to happen. Yep. You got to have a pass rush. You got to be able to stop the run and get into predictable situations, force the offense into predictable situations. If they're chewing up yards in the running game, uh, constantly have uh, the entire playbook at their availability, it's going to be a difficult day on anyone. Yeah. All right. Let's get to call your shot. We asked y'all how you are feeling about OU's defensive back situation right now. This first one comes from Sooner Thrawn, who says 70% of pass coverage is pressure on the quarterback. With our depth and improved pass rush, it will be better. Bowen, the best talent at safety since Roy Williams. There's a lot to unpack there from a man sooner thrown. I would love to know where the 70% of pass rush is based off pressure on the quarterback. I would love to know where that statistic came from. I, I feel like it just came from him, but hey, it is what it is. He talked about the improved pass rush. What do you think about that part of things? And then Bowen, the most talented guy since Roy Williams. I have woo, woo. Lot to unpack there. Um, if 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 you get to a, a place where seventy percent of your pass coverage is dictated by your pass rush, then you're in a really good spot. We are not there. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have an improved pass rush yet to be determined? We've got we've got a couple of guys that have um, some good skills and. Like, is Trace Ford going to be healthy? We'll see. He's not doing a whole lot this spring. Um, does the young Adabare come around? We'll see. Can be tough. It's a. It's not just the easiest position. Does our Mason Thomas become more consistent with his pass rush and you know get more opportunities to be out there and get the opportunities? You got to be able to do more than just run around the corner. Um, you know, right now. Our best pass rusher on this team is a transfer from Wake Forest. So, I have we gotten better? Yeah, because of that transfer. We'll see if we continue to develop. I, the more I see, I feel like Bothroyd's the best player along the defensive front. Yeah. Most and consistent, can play run, can play pass. He's technically proficient, good with his hands. That man's thick too. <laughs> he is. He is. I, I don't know. You, what are we thinking about? Two seventy five. He's don't listed know. at two fifty. That is a flat out lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not very tall though. So I don't know. Guy can play, man. That's that's all that if, matters. If, but he does if you not put him in a lineup. No one would say that he's the best pass rusher on the team. Okay, he's 275. He's listed at 275 now. That so that I think that's very accurate. He moves that, well for 275. Absolutely. The thing just going back to the pass rush piece of this. The thing that concerns me isn't necessarily the edge. I believed this for a long time as a former interior offensive lineman. There's nothing that can screw what an offense wants to do up quite like an interior pass rush. That's where my concern is. Mm -hmm. Do we have the guys in the interior of the defensive line that can make quarterbacks uncomfortable? Right. And I don't know. There's, there's a lot of stuff in college football offenses now where the ball's getting out very, very quick. You can only do so much when the quarterback's getting the ball out of his hands in like two seconds. Right. But can Co and Kelly and La Ulu and whoever like can they can they win as pass rushers? Yeah, that that's the big question mark for me because like an interior pass rush can ruin can ruin an offense's day. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we have that guy or those guys on the interior that can that can accomplish that. We don't. Not right now, but my hope is that I I think 
I think Luulu's got a chance to be a good interior guy. You know, he spent a lot of time on the edge, which, you know, is you get to work some different pass rush skills on the edge. And I think they translate well to the interior. If, if he's got great length and you talk about it all the time about, you know, like sometimes guards have, don't have the length that tackles have. And if he can use that to his, as a strength of his, you still, you got to play with great, you can't just win with length. You've got to win with pad level and technique. But if he can get that down to where that arm length becomes a big advantage for him on the interior, I think he could be really tough to deal with. Yeah, And he needs to put on some weight. Yeah, he's going to continue to add some weight and hopefully some some significant strength gains come with adding good weight, right? That's usually what you're looking for is like, hey, if you're adding 20 pounds between now and when we kick this thing off, you should get a hell of a lot stronger too, you know, r- relatively speaking. Mass moves with mass. Absolutely. But, yeah, this this other one comes from Doc Jones, and I thought this was pretty interesting. He says Jamarian Burt and Jaden Rowe are the defensive backs who will emerge by season's end. That's one hell of a prediction from our man, Doc Jones. Yeah. Well, I, I've i been bullish on Jaden Rowe for a long time. He is, he's got some unbelievable uh, ability. He's big. He looks like a linebacker, but he's got elite speed. And athleticism, I I hope that's the case. You know, I I he's got the physical tools now. They started him at corner to work on just some some general coverage skills. He's moved to safety, and hopefully, all that helps translate really well for him. He's still raw, what you would consider raw, but he can make up ground. I mean, he's when you've got a guy that looks like he does and can run like he does. Like it just it just takes things clicking into place for you to all of a sudden start getting attention out there. Yeah. At the absolute least, he should be an he should be a menace on special teams. Yep. With with that speed at that size. And hey, you ball out on special teams that gets the coach's attention. Yep. That has been that's a tale as old as time. So, uh, at the very least, that dude should be flying down on punt, on kickoff, and making plays. Totally There's just true. no excuse at that size and speed to not be doing that. Yep. That's right. A weapon. All right. Birthday shout-outs time. Happy 18th birthday to Hayden Sumter. Happy 23rd birthday to Rianne Nolan. Happy 30th birthday to Canton Viverka. Ooh, the big 3-0. Let's go, Canton. Nice. Happy birthday to Chad Crawford. All right. We've got some big spring games this weekend. Certainly some things that we're interested in seeing. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Loves Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch the price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile-to-go zone. And, of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Amore. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise and is the best place to get your OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. If you want to live your life in butter soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And hey, you hungry out there? Well, then head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, 
butter toasted buns and some ice cold beer. Their food is fantastic and it is the perfect spot to watch any big game. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. All right, National College Football Roundup. Been a while since we've taken a look around the country in the world of college football, but got some big spring games this weekend. Man, and I am I'm a huge fan of how many of these are being televised. Yeah. Now, it makes it I my Saturday is planned. I will be on my butt watching spring games around the country. <laughs> so, and, and Friday night, I know you love a good Friday night spring game, Ted. Yes, I do. TCU going Friday night, Saturday, we've got we got a lot of schools, but among them some of the big dogs, Ohio State, Clemson, Texas, Tennessee, USC, Florida State, Georgia. Uh, we get a look if we, I don't know if it's on TV, but Cincinnati, Kansas State. But I, which ones, when, when you look at some of these on the list, Ted, which, which spring games are you most excited about? And what are maybe some of the main things you want to see? Well, there's a lot of them that are really interesting. We'll start with TCU on Friday night, quarterback. Right, I mean that's that's the big one. Um, replacing your quarterback from a year ago, Chandler Morris um, won the quarterback battle in fall, got banged up and lost his his spot. Um, you know, for the rest of the season, which understandably with with the play that you can, that we witnessed. can I jump in with this? Mm -hmm. I hear this all the time, and I think it's one of the dumbest things ever. You can't lose your job to injury. What? <laughs> Why do people say that? It's not true. Chandler Morris got hurt. Max Duggan came in. He was amazing. And guess what happened? Chandler Morris never got on the field again. Yeah. You can absolutely lose your job if you get injured. I mean, it's that's one of the silliest things I hear in sports. Yeah. Well, um, I did you... Did you hear, I think it was Baylor's defensive coordinator said that they were worried that they were going to knock Duggan out of the game and Chandler Morris was going to come in. Like that was one of the things that they were concerned about, which is interesting, right? Um, and I can't remember if Duggan was like hobbled at that point in the season, but Chandler Morris is a really good quarterback. He's fast. He's... Um, you know, he, he's maybe at times a little bit too much of a gunslinger. I, he'll take some chances, but he's going to be – for teams that are replacing quarterbacks I, and don't have just a, already a room full of five-star guys, like that's about as good of an option as you're going to get for an experienced guy bouncing back. So I'm interested to see what the TCU looks like because they got a running back they got to replace. They got a first-round wide receiver they got to replace, amongst other um, skill position guys. They got, what, two inside backers that they got to replace. A got to replace, got to replace their center and left guard. Yeah, I know how much you care about interior lineman play. No, I mean, it's – they've got like, – last year TCU was fantastic. They barely survived a bunch of Big 12 games. I'm not suggesting that they were lucky. They were a really good team, and they deserved where what they got. But the stars aligned for them last year. I'm curious to see how they bounce back. I think it's going to be an uphill battle for them. It, it feels that way to me as well. But And their, their spring game's on ESPN Plus on, on Friday night. I believe it kicks off at 7. Not only am I interested to see – you know, how they replaced Quentin Johnson and Kendra Miller, how they replaced Steve Avila, who was head and shoulders, their best offensive lineman. I want to see what the offense looks like, right? You, you lose Garrett Riley, Clemson comes and poaches him. You bring in Kendall Bryles. I, I get this notion that a lot of people think the, the Baylor style, like that Bryles tree offense, and what Lincoln Riley and Garrett Riley kind of do are similar. They, they are very different systems. Mm -hmm. So, and Sonny Dykes has said it like it's going to be, they're they're going to be more air raidy this season. They just had one hell of an offense last year. 
and Duggan had a phenomenal season. I, I'm interested to see just how different the offense looks. They're going to play with way more tempo, I would assume. So that's not only am I excited to see what Chandler Morris looks like, I'm a, I'm excited to see the entire offensive operation and just how how different it looks from what we saw from them a year ago with Kendall Bryles calling the plays. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting is um, Kendall Bryles, like that that system has a lot of quarterback called run in it. And Duggan carried the ball a lot last year. A lot of it was, some of it was called run. A lot of it was, you know, pulling the ball down and making something happen. You're afforded that ability whenever you've got the guy that actually won the quarterback job standing on the sideline. I, I don't know what Chandler Morris's backup looks like now. And like, that's a factor in how much you run somebody. And especially if they've got an injury history. I mean, we ran into that last year. We weren't able to run Dylan Gabriel as much as we wanted to because we, we didn't have a, a good backup quarterback situation. So that's something to look at there. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, they're probably going to, with Sonny Dykes and his history, and Kendall Bryles and what they do, I. This is like a meshing of all of the, kind of the current systems in college football. It's going to be interesting to see what it looks like. It's a good point. Yeah, and we haven't even talked. They they lost some really good players on defense. Yeah, both defensive ends. Uh, Hodges Tomlinson at corner, lost winners at backer. <laughs> like they lost a lot, man. So lot. yeah, I'm I'm fired up to to watch that one on Friday night. What, what other spring games? What are you looking for? Got to, there are some, there are a ton of spring games this weekend. Texas. Mm. I, we, couple of things that everyone wants to see the quarterback battle, right? Ewers and Arch Manning. What does that look like? Uh, how do they replace B. John Robinson? Texas has been horrible when B. John Robinson is not in the game running the football. And, they they just they you cannot survive at big time football if you can't have some type of running game. To me, that's the biggest question for Texas. I I agree with that, but I'm looking at something different. And I, I said it last year. I didn't like I, I liked what I saw from Texas, but I didn't like it from the OU perspective. They're actually starting to build an offensive line. And in my opinion, that has been their their weakness along the offensive line has been what has held that program back for qu quite some time. Mm -hmm. They got some talented dudes along that O-line. And they got a good coach. And they got a really good coach that can recruit. And so 1 p.m. on Longhorn Network on Saturday, you got to scroll a while, but you'll find it, people, on your cable package. Yeah, I want to see Arch. I want to see if Quinn Ewers has taken the step that I think a lot of people are expecting him to take. I want to see how they replace Bijan and Roshan. I, I, I get all that. But really, what I'm going to be watching is that offensive line, that first group. Because it, if Kelvin Banks has made a leap, if some of the guys on that interior have made leaps, that's going to be a good group, man, because the talent is there. You mentioned they're really well coached. They played as technically sound with their hands and feet as I've seen them play in a long time a season ago. If that group is really good, that makes – no matter who's playing quarterback, that makes their life way yep. easier. And yep. Bijan's an he was an incredible player. But if that O-line is rolling – Everything falls in place offensively for them, especially Steve Sarkeesian. The dude knows offense. He's got a he's good system. He's incredibly creative. If he's got an O-line that is coming off the rock and moving people and locking people down in pass protection, I'm telling you right now, Texas is going to be not good, but great on offense, especially with you when you look at the weapons they've got at wide receiver, starting with Xavier Worthy. And then I can we find can we find a guy for us that looks like Jatavian Sanders at tight end? I still I do. Yeah. They're gonna be legit offensively if that O line has made some substantial progress. 
Yep. That's that's the key for them. That's the key is um, being able to run the ball without Bijan doing things on his own, making the the free guy miss and, and doing some great like. I don't know how much of it was offensive line. I don't know how much of it was. I mean, they had good depth at back. So I, I, you got to just boil it down to offensive line. Like if they make that leap that you're talking about, it could be a dangerous team. Good system on defense, talented on defense. Got uh, a handful of players that they've got to replace. But let's be honest. We all know that they've got a deep roster with highly recruited players. And this is going to be – year three in that defensive system. So you're starting to get guys that are really experienced in it and should have a really good background, should be making some some big leaps forward with what you get, you know, kind of consistency wise. One of one of the other spring games I'm interested, Tennessee, right? Really good year for Josh Heupel last season. But 130 on SEC Network on Saturday. Ted, remember the $8 million NIL deal? Oh, yeah. Well, that guy's in Knoxville now. I would have seen me some Nico Iamaliava. Like it, it, I don't know if Joe Milton's going to end up being the guy at quarterback for Tennessee. He came in last year when Hooker went down. And he did some good things. The guy has an absolute rocket launcher attached to his right arm. But anytime I know that a kid got 8 million. I'm trying to see what he's got. I don't care about anything else in that game. I want to see what Ia Maliava can do as a early enrollee true freshman, because I'm not sure anyone in the country is going to get more attention than that kid. That when people know you're getting that amount of money, man, there's going to, a lot of attention is going to be on you. Yeah. I I'm that's going to be fascinating. Yeah, man, I'm Milton is interesting. He's he's got a rocket for an arm, and he is huge. I mean, just a massive dude. You there's uh Nico's kind of he's fairly small, isn't he? Slight. I would yeah. say slight. Like it's two totally different looks of of players. So yeah, that's that's gonna be interesting. Like they I know that they've you know Hypo system, Levy system, um, Kendall Bryle system at TCU. They've all kind of grown from the same tree, so to speak, and a lot of quarterback run in these in these systems. So curious to see like a guy a slight build like Nico compared to uh, a guy that looks like a a massive tight end or something defensive in I that's something that you have to consider yeah I, I think you you look at you know Georgia Ohio State yeah there's going to be a lot of attention on those quarterback battles they're you know replacing CJ Stroud replacing Stetson Bennett there in Athens but whoever wins those jobs going to have so much talent around them I I really I, I really don't care one one quarterback situation I am really interested is Clemson Cade Klubnik, I, I feel like that guy's got a lot of pressure on him, right? DJ Uyunglele, that did not go according to plan. But a lot of the blame fell on the offensive system. Well, we saw what Garrett Riley did a year ago at TCU with that group. Mm -hmm. Klubnik, you can no longer blame it on the offensive system. You're going to have one of the most proven offensive systems, right, recently in college football. So now, yeah, there's there's pressure on Garrett Riley to to get things done offensively, but I feel like most of that pressure now falls on Clubnet. Like he's got to he's got to be the guy. Like you went, Dabo went and got Garrett Riley. No more, you can't play the offense anymore, Cade Clubnet. Now you gotta you gotta make some things happen. So I think Clemson fans are gonna be very dialed into what Clubnet's looking like at noon on ACC network on Saturday. Yeah, I it's fascinating. Clemson has you know, defense has continued to look really good and they've got it going on that side, but the offense is just it's it's been since Trevor Lawrence left, it's 
there's not really anything that's happened there. It's been wild to witness. You know, they they had such good quarterback play there back to back um with Deshaun Watson and then uh you know, I guess you had a brief time before was it Kelly Bryant before um uh uh Lawrence took over. So like you're just used to these offenses spitting out huge numbers. Pressure's on. I mean, I, I'm sure Garrett Riley's feeling it too. Like everyone's going to be watching what Cade, you know, Clubnet looks like. But you know, he's just had 15 practices really to install this thing at full speed. So that's that's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, uh, a couple other things. I don't think K State's is on TV. I couldn't find a channel for it at least, but I do think it would be an absolute joy to see Will Howard continue to ball out and make us look like idiots. Gosh. Are you, uh, are, are, is there any part of you that feels it was just fluky? No. Like the real Will Howard is going to show back up. No, I think the Colin Klein, Colin plays Will Howard. I think, I think Klein has given Will Howard an infusion of confidence and confidence is key. The guy is huge. Also. Yeah. I mean, that's a big dude. That entire O line came back. I'm pretty sure like yeah. essentially the entire group, or at least all the good guys. Right. Cooper Beebe was Big 12 Offensive Lineman of the Year. He shouldn't have been. Anton Harrison should have been. But he was like, you know what? I'm coming back. So, I mean, the Pretty line's going to be good. You you got to replace Deuce Vaughn, clearly, who had a massive impact in, in that program. You got to replace Malik Knowles. Like you, but I think Will Howard's going to continue to make us look like dum dums. Yeah, and I don't want I don't want to downplay Deuce Vaughn and Malik Knowles, but. If Will Howard, like we saw Will Howard last year, comes back and that entire offensive line is back and stays healthy, like running back a wide receiver is the easiest thing in the world to replace if you have those two things. If you have yeah. a quarterback that's playing out of his mind and a what may be the best offensive line in the conference, then you, the rest is easy. Yeah. The, the only other thing, I'm interested in, I wonder if you can bet on this anywhere. H how many shots of Cliff Kingsbury we are going to get on the <laughs> USC sideline? How about that, man? And, and how many, how many shots of Cliff and Lincoln Riley side by side do you think we'll get that, that game Saturday, 2 PM on PAC 12 network all the over them. under it's just, there's going to be a cliff cam nonstop in the, in the corner of the, of the TV. Uh, I think it was a, amazing hire by Lincoln Riley agreed but like one of the rule of rules of thumb in life is you don't hire a better looking version of yourself right because <laughs> that's kind of what he's done um I I think it's great I think it's going to help a ton of recruiting I think it, it just gives just gives a, a a really good vibe about the program um to have a, an analyst of that caliber there they i think they share a lot of common uh thinking offensively the way that they they go about things and you know, depending on how much he wants to put on the plate of of cliff i don't know but i would imagine it has an uh, uh, like he can either delegate some of the kind of head coaching duties to a guy like Cliff, or he can delegate some of the offensive stuff, like the game planning and quarterback stuff. Like there's there's a bunch of different ways you can go with it. I I I think it's just a good all around hire. I I think there's some Arizona Cardinals fans that just heard that and they're like, you don't want to delegate the game management stuff to him. <laughs> okay, right, <laughs> but. In all seriousness, and I know that a lot of people that listen to this have a have a cynical view when it comes to Lincoln Riley and Cliff Kingsbury. I think USC now has, I mean, the best collection of offensive minds in college football. People that, and I know it didn't go well for Cliff necessarily at Tech, and it didn't go particularly well for him at Arizona, but the dude knows offense and has had a lot of successful offenses and now him taking what he, the experience that he gathered in the national football league 
and being able to bring everything that was successful for them there and bring it to college. Like, just think now you, now if you're preparing to play USC, you got to go watch some Cardinals tape. Yeah. Uh, that's not fun, man. <laughs> and, nope. and I think the big winner in all this is Caleb Williams. You already had Lincoln Riley. You're in that offense. He's calling plays. He's teaching you in the quarterback room. And now you get Cliff Kingsbury to come in. He's going to be sitting in that quarterback room. He's going to be teaching. He's going to say, hey, this this is what you'll see in the league. Like it's, it's, it's almost like he's got even another leg up. Like he already had the physical ability. I mean, my goodness. Yep. But now he's going to get a crash course not only on how – to play on Saturdays, but now, Hey, this is, this is some of the stuff you're going to see on Sundays next year when you're probably the first overall pick. It's, it feels like a big win for Caleb Williams. A lot of people think it's, um, he just steps in and takes over when Lincoln Riley goes wherever Caleb Williams is going to go the first round or the number one pick overall. (laughs) Cliff, Cliff would look good as the USC head coach. (laughs) Yeah, I think we can all like, agree on that. Yeah, they're they're kind of preloading, uh, picking Cliff's brain for a year before they go to the NFL together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll hey, see. Could be it. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, students prepare to meet their potential with an individualized academic path that strives for success. Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSS, AA athletics, where they've won over 100 state championships, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted. Kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? OU softball. Huge mm. shock. Uh, they've got some uh, some interesting statistics going on right now. Um, they just went down and beat LSU in Baton Rouge in front of one of the biggest crowds that uh, stadium has ever seen. Place looked rowdy. Place was rowdy. Um, they got a shutout. 14 14- and O this year against ranked opponents. Um, they've won 29 straight games. They are eight and O versus the SEC right now. Uh, with last night's shutout, which by the way, uh, Jordy Ball 13K shutout, scattered three hits. It's her fifth shutout of the season. Leads Only the, what uh, one one walk too? Is that right? One one walk, and I think it did she. She got a walk and maybe a fielder's choice in the first inning and then retired like the next 14 batters in a row or something like that. She was mowing them down yeah. on ESPN, um, too. I love I love when they get the ESPN treatment, by the way. I agree. It's How awesome. about this? Uh, 30 consecutive scoreless innings pitched by the uh, the softball staff. That'll work. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Um just uh, all kinds of stuff. They they look great. Ball had 13 Ks. Uh, like I said, shut out with just three hits. Uh, they're mowing mowing them down right now. They look really really good. Did you see the graphic comparing 
the three peat season from UCLA to what OU's doing right now? The the home run, the home run column of that graphic was, or I guess it's technically a row, right? It goes horizontal. Right. It's a row. Is truly staggering. Crazy. What was it like? Twenty nine to three hundred and something. Twenty five to like three eighty something. Just unbelievable. <laughs> Which you I know, mean, part of it is like the development and the progression of the sport, right? But but still, like no one hits the amount of home runs that OU hits. It's not even close. And it's, what they've done over the stretch is is just nuts. And and the scary part for me, did. Did you see? Did you see Patty Gasso's presser after the game? No. So very complimentary to Jordy Ball, right? And LSU, they did the thing that a couple teams have been doing, where they're going to throw a lot of different arms. Yep. Right. They're not going to let you see a pitcher twice, or it seems like that's the plan. Like, hey, Tech let's keep Oklahoma. It. Yeah. Now you got to have four pitchers, or what? They pitched four girls. Yeah. So you got to have four arms that you think are high enough quality to get, you know, to get outs against Oklahoma's lineup. But they go to the road and LSU's a ranked team. It's a hostile environment. Patty Gasso, not happy with the offense. Yeah. Not pleased at all. And here, I got the quote here. It, they they actually got out hit by LSU, I guess. But Gasso said, quote, this team is going to have to work hard. We're planning to work hard and get out of this and get back on track offensively. You just went down to Baton Rouge, beat a ranked team. Jordy Ball throws a shutout, and she's like, we're going to get this right. Yeah. If I, if I were, you know, this weekend they've got, they're going up to Miami of Ohio. They've got Oakland, Louisville, and Miami of Ohio. If I was those teams, I'd be going, oh, no. <laughs> oh no. Cause it feels like anytime Patty says something like this, they do correct things very Definitely quickly. Bounce back in uh in a pretty strong fashion. And you know, I liked what she said before the game. She said that, you know, I she wants that place to be rowdy. She wants it to be loud. Um, you know, they, they go on the road a lot and you know, they walk into the stadium and they hear a bunch of boomer sooner chants, and she's like, dang it, I we we need some uh adversity right we need we need some some rowdiness some some uh tough places to play so no nah, it's cool they are uh like we all imagine they are they are moving along very nicely 70th home run last night is uh is what that was from was it Brito i think hit the home run so yeah crazy they're very this just in, and we've had some comments. Some people want to talk, want us to talk a little more softball. What else can we say about it, man? They just, they just kill everybody. There's really, and that's kind of the interesting thing. There's, there's not a whole lot to say, unless like you have an injury or or something happen, or they lose <laughs> until the postseason, right? It's just, it's the monster you've created. Yeah. You know? It is what it is. It is what it is. All right, who do you have as your loser of the week? I had to go with beer drinkers. The, the amount of love Major League Baseball is getting with the rule changes is, is oh, fantastic. I thought, oh, good. I thought you were about to send us down a Bud Light path, and I was like, <laughs> we, are, we are not doing that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, no, like the stolen bases are through the roof. Pace of play. Incredible. Everyone loves it, except for the beer drinkers. Most stadiums stop serving alcohol in the seventh inning, and they're just getting to the seventh inning too fast. And, and they've had to change. Like There is no like Major League Baseball mandated rule about when they can sell or not sell. That's up to each individual stadium. And they're starting to extend it into the eighth and ninth innings now because uh, – it all happens so fast. I think it's I think it's cool. It's a good problem to have, I think. You you're gonna start seeing guys carrying like two crates of like eight beers each, trying to do something crazy, like, hey, I got it, I got it. I I watched I watched a Rangers game 
and it started during my radio show or maybe right before I got started. And it was over before my radio show was over. And, and it was one of those things was like, dang, these are moving. These are moving quick. But I think, I think for the most part, other than some of these things that are happening with, you know, these calls strike three because the batter's not in the box quick enough. That that stuff's a little annoying. I think that'll all get ironed out over the season. But it does seem like people are really enjoying the faster moving baseball games, from what yeah. I can tell. I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I know the Yankees are stealing a lot of bases and yes. I'm not sh- one of the teams that's that's leading it. I can't remember who it is, but I think last year the league lead in stolen bases was like 130 something ish around that number and whoever's leading right now is on on pace to steal like 280 bases this year. Cleveland Please. is the current steals leader on pace for 280. Look at the big brain on you. Wow. I but that's what people want, right? They want less dead you know, guys messing with the rosin bag, strapping batting gloves on, and more action, more balls in play, more more things happening on the field, and seems awesome. Except for the beer drinkers. Yeah, tough tough day for the beer drinkers, but I I think I think they'll figure it out. I think they'll adjust. They'll adjust. They'll, <laughs> if I know beer drinkers, they will adjust. They they will adjust. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first, John Vance Auto Group has been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family owned and operated. They've got nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. No matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. Carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way which is why they have their lifetime loyalty program here's how it works buy a new or used car all you have to do is get the manufacturer recommended maintenance done at the vance dealership and if something goes wrong with the components of your engine transmission drive axle or transfer unit they will cover the repair costs it's a great deal you can browse their entire inventory or find the john vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com And First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma, tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. All right, for my winner of the week, thought about going with Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks. Now, there's some weird stuff, right? Weird rumors uh, on, on social media before this game that the Hawks ownership had given the Hawks management the green light to possibly trade Trey Young. That had become a big talking point, and he handled it like a professional, man. He, they went to Miami, they beat the heat and really they, they beat the heat by being more physical than the heat, which is kind of their calling card. Mm-hmm. So they win the seven, eight play in game. Trey had 25, eight and seven. And it wasn't just him. They had seven guys in double figures. I, I mean, I was really, really impressed with how they handled business uh, on the road in that game. And it sets up a fun matchup between Atlanta and Boston in the first round, but I, I was really impressed with all, all things considered like the circumstances with those rumors. I thought, I thought Trey young really carried himself well and put together a nice performance. That's a nice win for the Hawks. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's interesting with the, with, with the rumors buzzing around and some of that stuff can become a distraction, but Hey, good for them. Go out there and get a good win. And uh, what's up, what's up next for them now? For the Hawks, yeah, they 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 now play the Celtics in a seven game series. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. which the Celtics are very very good. I think the Hawks, maybe they can win a game or two. It's probably going to take Trey having, you know, a couple a really su- significant nights shooting the three. 
because Boston is just, they're loaded, man. It's yeah. a good team. So we'll good we'll stuff. see how it goes for him. But it was fun to watch him go get that win. Now, my winner of the week is a guy that I, I'm not going to lie, I hadn't heard about until yesterday. Tony Petiti. According to ESPN, he's going to be the next commissioner of the Big Ten Conference. And I don't know the exact number, but he's my winner of the week because I'm pretty sure that co- that job comes with a very significant paycheck. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. And an interesting background, former COO of Major League Baseball, has a ton of media experience, right? Worked at ABC where he helped create the BCS. He was part of that. Uh, worked at CBS and the stuff he did there included, you know, working on March Madness, working with the NFL. Uh, I, I think that he he was the head of MLB Network at one point. Most recently, he was the co-CEO of that thing that Tannenbaum started, uh, the 33rd team, which it's a bunch of NFL content. So I I think he's about to get paid a ton of money, and it's not a bad gig to take over. Uh, you're the guy after Kevin Warren. So you're the guy after the guy that a lot of people didn't like. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I, you already have an awesome TV deal done, right? You have it in hand and everyone was really, really impressed with it. I'm definitely interested to see if, if he's interested in further expansion for the big 10 conference. Uh, hopefully we get to know his thoughts on all of that soon, but. It seems like a good hire from everything I could gather about Petiti. It seems like he is sliding into a really good gig. So yeah. good for him. Uh, he's got a really good background in um, making sure sports get good exposure, right? And in television and making sure that uh, or being a part of because uh, because that's really all, what what it's become you know, as a, as a conference commissioner is you're essentially a liaison or the bridge builder between the, the product and, you know, the networks. And I, you got to have someone that knows what they're doing in that world. And it sounds like he does. So I'm, I'm interested in the expansion thing too. And it feels like the PAC 12 is just like teetering right now. And I don't know. I I think the latest CW news right now that we have we have a commissioner in place or soon to be in place there in the Big Ten. I would assume that all those Pac-12 schools that have been probably been calling Brett Yormark and the Big 12, I would assume they're making some calls to Petiti saying, hey, what do you think? What do you think about us? And I it's gonna be interesting. It, it seems like it seems like Kevin Warren was on a was on a path to add in a couple more schools if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. He left to take the Bears gig, and that all kind of just stopped. Right? You can't you can't expand further when you don't have a commissioner in place. Well, now the commissioner is uh, or soon to be in place. So let the realignment articles roll, baby. Here we go. We're gonna do it again. Yeah, it's 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 wild. But you know, we've talked about this before. Time is ticking. Like, if it's going to happen, I I think it's before before midsummer. I think you will everything. If it's going to happen, you will know where everybody's going. Yeah, before media days, probably. Yeah. If some if something's going to happen, we'll see. All right, for my loser of the week, thought about going with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Keep Devin White happy. What are we doing? Stud. Stud inside backer has requested a trade. Sounds like he's upset that he hasn't gotten a new contract done. What are you guys doing? Bucks just just pay the man his money. He's legit. He's a fantastic player. Just pay the man his money. And then it's one less thing to worry about. Mm. Yeah. You you got to have a guy that is is consistent and uh, consistent's really I, I don't want to make it sound like he's consistent. He's one of a handful of the best linebackers in the entire NFL. You know what you're going to get game in, game out from him. He's a leader of the defense. You keep him. Yeah. So let's not make that too difficult there, Tampa Bay. 
also thought about going with Rory McIlroy. Are we are we worried about our guy, Ted? I I don't I guess I don't know enough to be worried, but not a lot of info out there now. Misses the cut at the Masters, right? Plays really poorly, and now his has withdrawn from the RBC Heritage this week. And, and remember, with the changes the PGA Tour made with with those designated events, if you're in the top twenty of the Player Impact Program, which obviously Rory McIlroy is. You can only miss one of those 17 designated events. And he skipped, what was it, the Tournament of Champions to start the year? So this will be the second designated event he's missed. No one knows why he's missing it. It maybe comes out that it's a family situation and we we can all, you know, kind of move on. But this could end up costing him $3 million mm. with with that whole that whole pip situation. And I, I know Rory McIlroy's made a ton of money, man. I get that. But losing $3 million isn't cool. No. That's not good. I, and he, you, you got to figure that there's, there, that he's got something legitimate. I, right. Knowing that that's the case, whether it's injury or personal matter. I, it's not like he's scared to go play it, you know. I, I, I don't know. I that's. I hope everything's okay with the guy. I thought he was going to have a good Masters. You and thousands and thousands of other people that bet on him to win. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, it it is what it is. But I just, you're right. I hope he's all right because it. The timing's just not good, right? He no. just, he people like. You look at how he played at the Masters, and now he's withdrawn. It just the optics are not great, right? Golfers are weird. Like <laughs> he may have played like played poorly in the Masters and been like, "I have some things I need to change in my swing. I'm not playing another event until I get it right. I don't care how much it costs." Like I, you know, I, that may be what he's going through right now. Who knows? Yeah, I don't. I don't think he's particularly worried about the money. So yeah. we'll. But three million dollars to three million dollars, man. I know. So, but but my loser of the week, and I love this guy, and I can't believe he played that poorly. Anthony Edwards from the Minnesota Timberwolves. Yikes! Now, I I will I will say, the NBA play in games they're awesome. Like I I loved watching the Hawks in the Heat. I the Lakers and Timberwolves game was such a mess at the end of regulation and overtime, I, it was, it was disgustingly beautiful. I mean, just <laughs> so good, but, and, and I'm sure for Anthony Edwards falling out of the air, right. Flipping over a guy and landing on your head and like your shoulder, not going to help your performance. Right. But he was out there on the court and he picked a awfully bad time. Right. When you consider the circumstances of that game, he picked an awfully bad time to have his worst game of the season. Brutal. Three of 17 from the field. O of nine from the three from three had nine points. That's not very good for a guy that averages nearly 25 points a game. All-star Minnesota was up 15 in that game at one point. And Anthony Edwards just couldn't get it going, man. It was any, he normally plays with like this fire and this bounce and this energy. And it was almost like things started so poorly for me. Never. He didn't look like the same guy. I don't know what that was, man. That was, I mean, the Timberwolves had every opportunity to beat the Lakers in that game. But Anthony Edwards, he just, he picked a bad night not to have it, man. Woo. Brutal. Now, did the Lakers get like 50 free throw opportunities to Minnesota's like 12 or something? They had they had a significant advantage. I think it was around like nine or 10 in free throws. But to, to the Lakers' credit, like they, they were more aggressive taking the ball to the basket. Minnesota, especially late yeah. in the game, settled for just awful shots. And, and that's in Carl Anthony Towns. And the inside the NBA guys pointed this out over and over and over again after the game. Like, 
they get in some of these switch situations and Carl Anthony Towns would have Austin Reeves or even Schroeder on him and wouldn't demand the ball. Like wouldn't try to seal him off. Would do it. Just kind of let it be. Isn't <laughs> and it crazy would... how much like the game has changed in that regard? Like... Yes. But like Giannis does that all the time. If you're going to switch Dennis Schroeder on Giannis, yeah. he's going down to the block and he said, give me the damn ball. That, that has been, I mean, Shaq has killed. Carl Anthony Towns for years for, and so is Barkley for being that big and that tall and just not, not using his size. That's a, that's a problem. I, I, I don't know. I if, should be like, if you're a guy like him and then they, they put someone that small on you, that, that should be like what you're excited about. Like, this is easy. Give me the ball. Like we'll get them out of this or we'll make them pay. Huh, that's that's wild. Shaq, Shaq said he doesn't want it. I was like, ooh, that's it's hard. It that game was the full Carl Anthony Towns experience. <laughs> Unbelievable start, just cooking offensively, then commits stupid fouls, so he's in foul trouble, which has been a common theme of his career. Didn't demand the ball when he got those advantageous switches. It just it was <laughs> The full experience and the end of regulation and overtime of that game. What a journey we went on. So many bad shots, so many bad turnovers, including some from LeBron James, which yeah, yeah he's throwing the ball away in at the end towards the end of regulation. He's throwing the ball away in overtime. You know, you thought Schroeder's three with what was it like 1.4 seconds? It was game. Did Anthony Davis fouls Mike Godley on a three at the buzzer? And you're just like, what is happening? This game is drunk. And uh, to Conley's credit, hits all three. That was, I mean, that was big time. But Torian Prince, he misses, misses the three after another LeBron. Like he turns it over on an inbounds play. Sets up a fast break. And Torian Prince, he just misses the three that, that would have tied it. But. LeBron knows they can't win the title. He's trying to go home, man. He's he trying. looked exhausted, <laughs> too. I mean, absolutely exhausted. Now, they get they get Memphis in the first round. There are going to be a lot of people. They're going to pick the Lakers to win that series. But the people that were undoubtedly going to pick them are now sitting there going, uh, I don't love what I saw in that play-in game. There's, I mean, there's some people that are going to be back on the fence in that whole thing. That's awesome. I'm nervous. By the time Don't some be. people by the time some people listen to this, the Thunder will have triumphed in New Orleans or the season will be over. Here we go. They'll win it. No big deal. I hope you're right. Thanks for saying that. That makes <laughs> that made me feel good. On that note, episode 308 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Sunday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.